Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to, to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is on the book of Ephesians. Imagine 14 lessons, because this quarter we have 14 Sabbaths in the quarter, on a book that's six chapters long. So we're going to dive into this book quite deeply. So let's go ahead. This is lesson number nine in that series for August 26 of 2023. And as usual, we like to begin with a word of prayer. Father, we recognize your presence among us for this important discussion about the words that you gave to your friend Paul while he was in prison in Rome to write to your other friends down in Ephesus. Help us to understand what you are trying to communicate and share it as best we can today as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm. Amen. Not long ago, a crystal jug was placed on auction in the United Kingdom. The auctioneer described it as a 19th century French claret or claret jug, estimated its worth at about U.S. $200. Two perceptive bidders recognized the jug as an extremely rare Islamic ewer. Its true appraised worth? Five million pounds, or about six hundred six point five million dollars. What allowed the bidder to walk away with such a bargain? The bidder knew something that the auctioneer did not: the true value of the jug. So, in Ephesians five one through twenty, Paul contrasts what pagans and believers valued. Pagans valued a racy story, a drunken party, a debauched sex, as the great treasures of life. Believers, though, know an ultimate day of appraisal is coming when the true value of all things will become apparent. Instead of placing their bid on partying and drunkenness, they lay treasures, among other things, all that is, <clears throat> I'm sorry, they treasure, among other things, all that is good and right and true. In, in Christ, Paul thus urges them to snap up the bargains found in Christ as they live, as we all do, on the threshold of eternity. That's from our Bible study guide for Sabbath afternoon, August 19. Jim, could you pick that up for us? Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. Since you are God's dear children, you must try to be like Him. Your life must be controlled by love, just as Christ loved us and gave His life for us as a sweet-smelling offering and sacrifice that pleases God. Since you are God's people, it is not right that any matters of sexual immorality or indecency or greed should even be mentioned among you. Nor is it fitting for you to use language which is obscene, profane, or vulgar. Rather, you should give thanks to God. You may be sure that no one who is immoral, indecent, or greedy for greed is a form of idolatry, will ever receive a share in the kingdom of Christ and of God. American Bible Society, Good News Translation. Wow. Mm. Have any of us ever been even a little bit greedy? Well, That's Jeremiah, kind of scary. I said the priests and the prophets were all motivated by greed, so it's been around a long time. I don't think it's yeah. unique to 2,000 yeah. years ago or even today. Our character is molded by what we take in through our eyes and ears and a certain amount through our tongues and our noses and so far touch, but uh, every day. And what does that, how does that impact us, Carrie? From the writings of Ellen G. White, EGW, it is the law both of the intellectual and the spiritual nature that by beholding we become changed. The mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is allowed to dwell. It becomes assimilated to that which is accustomed to love and reverence. Man will never rise higher than his standard of purity or goodness or truth. If self is his loftiest ideal, he will never attain to anything more exalted. Rather, he will constantly sink lower and lower. The grace of God alone has power to exalt man. 
Left to himself, his course must inevitably be downward. And that's wow. a great controversy, 555, paragraph 1. Okay, now let's think about the implications of that paragraph. If we could take all the information that goes into a child's brain from the point where he's born until he dies and try to figure out how that could be maneuvered and planted and implanted and so forth in the brain. And considering what everybody's being fed these days. It's all up there. Everything that we see or hear, as you say, it's stored in our brains. It's the retrieval process that's effective in most of us. The very dramatic example of that that happened maybe 70 years ago now was the famous neurosurgeon in Canada that Enfield. Yeah, opened up a brain and had a very tiny little electric probe and he was seeing a young lady who had had some problems with uh, pregnancy and so forth like that and delivery and he touched her brain and immediately she could see the delivery room, she could see everybody in the room so forth and it was just like, ah, she began to scream, she says, I know that, I got a it was all recorded there, completely. So now the challenge, how do we become imitators of God? We don't see him. We don't hear him uh, from, you know, audibly. Jennifer? From Ellen G. White. The prince of this world cometh, said Jesus, and hath nothing in me. John 1430. There was in him nothing that responded to Satan's sophistry. He did not consent to sin. Not even by a thought did he yield to temptation. So it may be with us. Christ's humanity was united with divinity. He was fitted for the conflict by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And he came to make us partakers of the divine nature. I'm going to interrupt for just a moment there. I've tried to wrap my mind around this idea. Partakers of the divine nature. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? How much does that imply? <clears throat> I'll let you out there think about it. Well, divinity really can't die, right? No. Can't. So, so then that ultimately, if you, what does Paul say in the uh, Philippians two and uh, eternal life in John seventeen? Is, yeah. Is to know. But this isn't this is just talking about uh, a physical or even a spiritual existence. <laughs> I think divine nature is talking about everything about you, what you think and how, what you, how you behave and everything. That's a pretty incredible, yeah. if I'm, I might be wrong, but that's what it sounds like to me. Go ahead, Jennifer. So long as we are united to him by faith, sin has no more dominion over us. God reaches for the hand of faith in us to direct it to lay fast hold upon, to lay fast hold upon the divinity of Christ, that we may attain to perfection of character. From so there's Desire of Ages saying it right there, that we may obtain, attain to perfection of character. So this is not just, you know, a simple thing. That's a pretty incredible. Well, writing from prison in Rome, we already know this, and let's just review that. The best, we have pretty good evidence that, well, we know that Ephesians and Colossians were written at the same time. They were, they were sent with Epaphroditus to Ephesus and Colossae from prison in Rome. He traveled there probably mostly by boat uh, and carried these letters and probably carried messages from Paul to those, those people over there. There's pretty good evidence that a short time later when he was just about to be released from prison, he wrote Philippians, wrote to the church in Philippi. A number of scholars believe that sometime during that, it was, he was in prison there probably for close to two years, that he probably wrote the book of Hebrews also. So this is the context. And he's Ephesians, Colossians, and especially Philippians were written when Paul's about to be released from prison. Remember, he was out for about two years again. Then he was re-imprisoned. And of course, that time they, they killed him. So that's the the context a little bit. 
So writing from prison in Rome, Paul reminded the Ephesians that they were to be and were to act like children of God. Gordon? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8 and 15. You yourselves used to be in the darkness, but since you have become the Lord's people, you are in the light. So you must live like people who belong to the light. Verse 15, so be careful how you live. Don't live like ignorant people, but like wise people. Good News Bible. Okay, there's a command. All of you act like wise people. Please do. But Paul recognized the baleful effects that debauched living was having on the Ephesians. I mean, what do you do? I mean, I, I, Ephesus would be the ancient Las Vegas. Probably quite a bit worse than Las Vegas. Try to just imagine that. I mean, and everything that they did in that city was focused on that temple and everything that was going on there. And they were, they believed, as we've said, that anything that happened inside that temple was fine because by definition, because it's inside the temple, it's holy. Undoubtedly, the angels in heaven were embarrassed by what was happening in the temple of Artemis Diana. Diana being the Latin name, Artemis being the Greek name. However, at the same time, Paul recognized the enormous attraction that those sexual practices which were done in the temple had for young people. He was afraid that some who had become Christians might be drawn back into that evil world. He reminded them that the lives that they had lived as young Christians were like a sweet-smelling savor to the inhabitants of heaven, as opposed to what was going on in the temple there. Paul wasted no time in getting into this, his subject and talking very bluntly about what he had in mind. It is interesting to note that in 1 Corinthians 5, 9, probably written from Ephesus, almost certainly written from Ephesus to the Corinthians, he mentioned a letter that he had written to them, quote, not to associate with immoral people. Now he's writing from one very immoral place to another pretty immoral place, and he's saying don't associate with those people. They just, they just ruin you. So is that like the uh, mayor of Las Vegas calling the mayor of Los Angeles and saying don't? Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Now, the interesting thing is, where is that letter he sent them? Probably embedded in 2 Corinthians. No, not or this is it one. 1 Corinthians? Not this one. This is before, this is before 1 Corinthians. Okay. You see, in 1 Corinthians 5, it says there, uh, he mentioned a letter that he had written to them, quote, not to such. So this was before 1 Corinthians. And the one, the last part of 2 Corinthians was written between 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. We have no idea what has happened to that letter. If you found that letter somewhere, would you be regarded as inspired because it was written by Paul? Well, notice these words from Paul, from 1 Corinthians 5, 9 to 11. In the letter that I wrote to you, I told you not to associate with immoral people. Now, I did not mean pagans who are immoral or greedy or thieves or who worship idols. To avoid them, you would have to get out of the world completely. <laughs> pretty, pretty clear there, isn't yeah. it? <clears throat> what I meant was that you should not associate with a person who calls himself a believer but is immoral and greedy and worships idols or is a slanderer or a drunkard or a thief. Don't sit down to eat with such a person. Wow. I mean, what is the... He didn't... No beating around the bush. No. Well, was Paul being a bigot in this passage? In our world, people are being told that we should accept everybody and love everybody, no matter what their practices are. Is it possible for a Christian to love the sinner but hate the sin? Is that what Paul was suggesting in this passage? He says, don't even sit down with them. That's pretty, pretty serious language, isn't it? Yep. Well, in 1 Corinthians 6, 12 through 20, he brought out, up some very significant ideas. I'm going to read just from 15 to 20. You know that your bodies are parts of the body of Christ. Shall I take a part of Christ's body and make it part of the body of a prostitute? Impossible. 
or perhaps you don't know that the man who joins his body to a prostitute becomes physically one with her. The scripture says quite plainly, quote, the two will become one body, end quote. But he who joins himself to the Lord becomes spiritually one with him. Avoid immorality. Any other sin a man commits does not affect his body, but the man who is guilty of sexual immorality sins against his own body. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and who was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourselves, but to God. He bought you for a price. Yeah, what a price. So use your bodies for God's glory. Jim, I'm going to ask you to take that next one there. In the Bible study guide, on the one hand, the Greco-Roman world of the first century exhibited the moral corruption and debauchery described elsewhere in the New Testament, see 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and so forth. For example, banquets of the wealthy regularly featured the behaviors Paul describes in Ephesians 5, 3 to 14. That is drunkenness, ribald speech, risque entertainment, and immoral acts. In addition, urban centers provided an anonymity and permissiveness that fostered immoral sexual practices from the Bible study guide for August 20. Okay. When we mention the word anonymity, does that remind you of anything in our day? Anonymous. A a well, and ads on TV that says what, la what happens in Las Vegas stays, stays in Las Vegas. Vegas. That's what we're talking that, that's about. That's really a lie because the, the disease goes from, <laughs> spreads all over. So. Yeah. The advertising world does a good job. Yeah. Clues right out of the book of Ephesians, huh? <laughs> the Ephesians claimed that the temple of Artemis slash Diana was holy and therefore anything that was done there was holy. And that's a, that's a, that ought to just hit you between the eyes. That's, that's a statement of the way those people in Ephesus lived. Well, well, well over 150 years ago, didn't they have the Holy Flesh movement back in the Midwest? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing new under the sun. Sim similar idea. That included some of the most debauched sexual practices known to man. I can just tell you that there were both plenty of both male and female prostitutes in that temple. Probably lived there. Okay, 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Carrie? Surely you know that the wicked will not possess God's kingdom. Do not fool yourselves. People who are immoral or who worship idols or are adulterous or homosexual perverts or who steal or are greedy or are drunkards or are slander others uh, or are thieves, none of these will possess God's kingdom. That's from the Good News Bible. That's quite a collection of people and of course we know about the societies and what's going on in our world today jennifer do you want to take on those next couple of paragraphs there sure so from the sda bible commentary effeminate the greek word is malakoi meaning basically quote soft of nature delicate or tender when used in connection with terms expressive of sensual vice as to those as those found in verse 9 it designates homosexuals more particularly those who yield themselves to be used for such immoral purposes abusers of themselves among mankind in greek arsinokoitai another term describing homosexuals comment okay. go ahead um that's uh from Comment on 1 Corinthians 6, 9 from the yeah. Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary. So, and that wouldn't be, that would be, would that be considered hate speech today? It would be considered intolerant. Yeah. And maybe hate speech. Paul was not ignorant to the fact that many of his Ephesian converts had been a part of all that had gone on in the Temple of Artemis in the past. These people had come, that's where they came out of. He was fully aware of the history of that kind of behavior in ancient Israel, as well as what its, it effect, what its effects were. And now just to pick a chunk of, story, a chunk of history 
of the, about the northern kingdom of Israel with the capital of Samaria. From okay. Second Kings 17, verses 7 onward, Samaria <coughs> fell because the Israelites sinned against the Lord their God, who had rescued them from the king of Egypt and had led them out of Egypt. They worshipped other gods, followed the customs of the people whom the Lord had driven out as his people advanced and adopt, adopted customs introduced by the kings of Israel. Why, why did the kings of Israel introduce them? Well, I'll, I'll give you a clue. Ahab, oh, wicked. one of the earliest kings of the northern kingdom, married Jezebel. Jezebel was the high priestess. Well, yeah, the high priestess. Her father was the high priest of Baal over in Sidon. And now he was, she was the high priestess because she was a daughter of the high priest. She was a high priestess. She came with a whole bunch of those uh, prophets from Baal country over in Israel. Their job was to evangelize, quote, Israel. Missionaries. <laughs> yeah. Verse 9, the Israelites did things that the Lord their God disapproved of. They built pagan places of worship in all their towns from the smallest village to the largest city. On all the halls and under the hills. and on on all the hills and under every shady tree they put up stone pillars and images of the goddess Asherah, and they burned incense on all of the pagan altars, followed the practices of the people whom the Lord had driven out of the land. Wow. They aroused the Lord's anger with all their wicked deeds and disobeyed the Lord's commands not to worship idols. So they did exactly the opposite of what they were told. Exactly. Kind of like kids. Kind of like adults, huh? Yeah. Verse 13, the Lord had sent his messengers and prophets to warn Israel and Judah, abandon your evil ways and obey my commands, which are com contained in the law. I gave to your ancestors in which I handed on to you through my servants, the prophets. But they would not obey. They were stubborn like their ancestors and like us who had not trusted the Lord their God. They refused to obey his instructions. They did not keep the covenant he had made with their ancestors and they disregarded his warnings. They worshipped worthless idols and became worthless themselves. And they followed the customs of the surrounding nations, disobeying the Lord's commands not to imitate them. Okay, let me interrupt for a second. Up there earlier we read, people's character, their natures is made up of what? What they see. Everything they take in, what they see and what they hear. And what's happening here? They're just totally embedded in that filth. Yeah. Okay, and so guess what happens to them? Yeah. Become filthy. Verse 16, they broke all the laws of the Lord their God and made two metal bull calves to worship. Where have we heard of that before? Yeah. Was that at Sinai? They also made an image of the goddess Asherah, worshiped the stars and served the god Baal. They sacrificed their sons and daughters as burnt offerings to pagan gods. They consulted mediums and fortune tellers and they devoted themselves completely to doing what is wrong in the Lord's sight and so aroused his anger. To use that term not as we use it now. The Lord was angry with the Israelites and banished them from his sight, leaving only the kingdom of Judah. Well, it, it is. It doesn't say the Lord came and punished them. What does it say? He let them go. He let them go. Remember that both Asherah and Baal were fertility cult gods and people were doing many of the same things that later polluted Ephesus. In what ways are God, Paul's words about sexual behavior applicable to your culture, wherever you live, around the world? What would Paul say about our woke society or the LGBTIQA plus movement? Myra? From Google, the, I can't even say all those letters like you did. LGBTIQA plus is an evolving acronym that stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, queer, questioning, asexual. Many other terms such as non-binary and pansexual. Oh, that's, I hadn't heard those either. Um, <laughs> you don't they, associate with the right people. I, I guess not. 
uh, that people use to describe their experiences of their gender, sexuality, and sociologic sex characters, characters. Wow. And maybe next week there'll be another letter added to the list. And how many more letters can you add? Lots. Paul recognized the influence of that the influence that fellow Ephesians might have if the Christian Ephesians associated with them. They would be lured back into some of their formerly practiced sins. So he repeatedly warned the Christians that they should not have any association with people involved in those immoral behaviors. Let us not conclude that everyone living in Ephesus was abandoned to evil. According from our Bible study guide, on the other hand, many of that, in that society lived virtuous lives and served as advocates for strict morality. When the New Testament provides vice or virtue lists and household codes, and there's examples from Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3 especially, its authors mirror themes in the wider Greco-Roman world. This world, at once debauched and virtuous, helps explain Paul's exhortations to avoid the immoral behavior practiced by the Gentiles while wishing for believers to be circumstance, circumspect in their behavior and so to e earn good standing among outsiders. So what do we have here? Let's think about this for a moment. God is saying, I mean, Paul is saying on behalf of God, you've learned the truth now. You know about what it means to live a virtuous life. Okay, go out. And I don't know whether he would dare to send somebody to the temple of Artemis, but he was saying, go out here and look at the society in which you're living and shine a light. How would you do that in a situation like that? I, you know, you, you can't pass out tracts. They didn't even have them in those days. I suppose you could stop people on the street and try to talk to them. Probably just by how they acted, by their own character, they could see the light. Yeah. Others could see the light. Yeah. Uh, I mean, how do you tell somebody that you're not going there to some place? Mm. You can say, come with me, let's go. But you can say... I guess you'd say to them, please don't go. I have something better for you. Yeah. <laughs> then Paul turned to the Christians themselves and talked about how they should relate to each other. Husbands to wives, wives to husbands, parents to children, children to parents, even masters to slaves and slaves to masters. It's all in Ephesians 5, 21 to 6, 9. Paul recognized that even a simple conversation with someone involved in those evil sexual practices might attract young people. And, I mean, even if you never went there, if you heard that kind of language all the time, you would be almost, you know, almost ha have to start using it. I mean, that's, where do we learn language? You learn a language from what other people around us say, right? Now, hopefully we've got some some filters along the way somewhere, but it's a special problem for young people. He warned them not to even use empty words that were associated with those practices. So Paul has simply essentially said, when God's end time judgment approaches, the wrath of God will come upon people who practice those kinds of things. I don't know. Um... We sometimes smile when we hear about people who stand up at, uh, what's it called, the uh, Hyde Park Corner, what's that place is called, the preachers, anyway, over in London. And people, you know, up there, you better straighten up your ways, otherwise you're going to end up in hell, da, da, da. And even, and you can guarantee if there's a marathon, if there's a major marathon, there's going to be all kinds of people. I've run so many marathons. There's all people along the track, you know, Jesus is Lord, da da, you know, not more than maybe 10 or 12 words. They don't want, they want to have don't more, they, want, they don't want to have more words than you can read as you run past. But, well, God's wrath, as we have said many times in this group, is simply his turning away in loving disappointment from those who do want him anyway. 
thus leaving them to the inevitable, awful, deadly consequences of their rebellious choices, even though God tries to woo them back to himself. Constantly, God is trying to reach out to the worst of people. For a much more complete explanation of God's wrath, see the handout on theox.org, and there's the complete URL under In General Topics in the section called Teacher's Guides. So why did Paul caution the believers not to be partakers with sinners? Jim? Ephesians chapter 12, excuse me, 5, verses 7 to 10. So have nothing at all to do with people, with such people. You yourselves used to be in darkness, but since you have become the Lord's people, you are in the right. Or you are in the light, excuse me. <clears throat> So you must live like people who have been, excuse me, have, who belong to the light, for it is the light that brings you a rich harvest of every kind of goodness, righteousness, and faith. Learn to, excuse me, try to Truth. learn what pleases the Lord. Good news yeah. Bible. <clears throat> hey, so I, I have sat down several times and said to myself, okay, you, you show up at this Las Vegas place, in Ephesus and no Christian has been there before and you stand on the street corner or you go into somebody's house I don't know what, what you do and what do you say? What do you say to get their attention? Oh, we're busy. We're, we're headed for the temple. Why don't you come with us? Would you say the earth is the stars are falling, the sky is imploding, um, the end is here. I, I, I have thought about this, and I, I would be happy to hear your results. I think that there's two things that would get people's attention. One is, he would say to them, let me tell you about someone who has the power, such a, the, the kind of power he was able to raise himself from the dead. You know, that would probably get people's attention for a little while. And then to say, that person is going to come back and he's going to take to heaven anyone who lives a healthy, happy, holy life. I think that would get attention. Then Paul himself, when he went to Athens, said, he's, he, all of us came from him. He's the father of everybody. He was there at the beginning. We didn't come from some other strange places. He was the father of all of us. If, if, you're, if you're talking to people who are used to worshiping a whole lot of strange things, that might get people's attention. I don't know, what do you think? What else might get their attention? Probably just the fact that you don't want to go where they're going. Maybe, yeah. Why don't you want to go? Yeah, exactly. Paul went to considerable effort to clarify how different the Christian lifestyle is from that which was commonly practiced in Ephesus. We know that eventually the entire world will be divided into two camps. As we approach the end of time, there will be one, those who are following the practices of Satan himself, and Revelation 13 says they will be worshiping Satan himself, and two, those who are practicing God's plan. Those two camps will be very different from each other. And when it talks about people worshiping the devil, I don't think they actually know that they're worshiping the devil. They're just practicing the devil's ideas. Mm -hmm. Selfishness, greed. is great stuff. So we already read Ephesians 5, 11 to 14, but what powerful warnings did Paul give? How does it apply to our situation? Let's look, let's look at it once again. Carrie? Ephesians 5, 11 to 14. Have nothing to do with the worthless things that people do, things that belong to the darkness. Instead, bring them out to the light. It is really too shameful even to talk about the things they do in secret. And when all things are brought out to the light, then their true nature is clearly revealed. For anything that is clearly revealed becomes light, uh, 
That is why it is said, wake up sleeper and rise from the death and Christ will shine on you. That's from Good News Bible. Now, we as Christians, we could, at least if you're opposing somebody had some kind of Christian background, you could say, well, the Bible says this and this and this, and maybe that would, that maybe that would impress them. Paul is talking to people who, I mean, he quotes this passage from the Old Testament. I mean, did they say, huh? Yeah. Well, the New Testament hadn't even been written. Paul hadn't done his part yet. And That's the others right. hadn't done theirs. That's right. So. I mean, the fact that you could quote something that was seven or 800 years old, would that impress some people? The fact that it's still, still available to read, possibly. Well, to understand these verses, it is helpful to observe that Paul repeatedly offers two exhortations, alternating between them. One, live a God-honoring lifestyle as children of the light. And there's a bunch of places, Ephesians 5, 8, 5, 1, 2, 4, 8, 10 to 11, da, da, da. And two, don't live a sexually immoral, God-opposing lifestyle, exhibiting the unfruitful works of darkness. Again, Ephesians 5, I'll see also 5. So Paul was accustomed to this. He said, think about this. This is, this is one group. This is what they're doing. And this is what's going to happen to them. Here's another group. This is what they're doing. This is what's going to happen to them. Believers are to expose the unfruitful works of darkness by exhibiting the righteous alternative for all to see. There's your answer. Could you please show off your righteousness? Meanwhile, we may take the challenging poetic language of verses 13 and 14 as Paul's daring assertion that believers, by exhibiting, quote, the fruit of the Spirit, end quote, Ephesians 5, 9, may win worldlings to faith in Christ. Well, Paul did. We don't know for sure what he, well, we, we do know one thing. Remember, he, he got to a place where people discovered that he could heal all kinds of things. They would even get handkerchiefs that he had used took them over to other places and healed people with them. Now that would get people's attention. I've suggested sometime, what if you went over to the hospital? What if Jesus showed up and went over to the hospital across the street over here and walked through and healed every single person in the hospital? And the question is this. One, they would all leave because they were well. How would it be reported in the newspapers the next day? And what would happen by the next day? Wouldn't the hospital be, there wouldn't be even room in the hallways for people hoping that he would be back. There already isn't room in the hallways. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I didn't have to mention that part. In order to warn the Christians in Ephesus the dangers of association with evil going on in Ephesus, Paul quoted a passage from Isaiah. And here's the passage that he actually uh, quoted. From Isaiah 60, 1 through 3. Arise, Jerusalem, and shine like the sun. The glory of the Lord is shining on you. Other nations will be covered by darkness, but on you the light of the Lord will shine. The brightness of his presence will be with you. Nations will be drawn to your light and kings to the dawning of your new day. From the Good News Bible. Very good. That sounds impressive. How do we live the kind of lifestyles that can expose works of darkness for what they are? Well, I had an interesting experience today. I was on my way walking around campus here and down by the Drayson Center. Some of you know that's a place where a lot of people go to exercise in various ways to stay in health, good health. And out of this place came someone who I have known for many years, who I used to run marathons with. And he said, oh, thank you so much for all this stuff you do for the Sabbath school classes. I love it and study it every week. So somebody's paying attention. <laughs> yeah. Paul concluded his passages in Ephesians 5, 1 through 20 by talking about two serious things of which he wanted the Christians to be aware. One, they needed to realize how important it was for them to follow the example of Jesus Christ 
and not to wander into the behavior typical of Ephesus. So which is better? Jesus Christ, Temple of Artemis. Jesus Christ, the Temple of Artemis. Wow. Two, he also told them that time must not be wasted. We have only short lives in this earth and we need to use those lives for the best possible results. From the Bible Study Guide, in Ephesians, Paul has repeatedly used the common Old Testament metaphor of, quote, walking, end quote, for how one lives. And there are several references given. Here he uses the metaphor to encourage intentional discipleship, just as you would, quote, watch your step when walking on a rough or darkened path, Believers should look carefully then how you walk. Because Ephesians 5.15 finds a parallel in Ephesians 5.17, we may look there for a definition of what it means to live as wise people. We do not look within for wisdom. To be wise is to reach beyond ourselves, to understand what the will of the Lord is. From the Bible Study Guide for Wednesday. So, what... Paul is saying is these ancient Greek and Roman religions, there were a variety of them, basically said that we're supposed to find truth from within ourselves. And what is Paul telling us? Truth is found not within us, but above us, uh, if we can use that term. He says the only way you can be safe is to follow the example of Jesus Christ. So, the question, are we adequately aware of the subtle dangers of slipping into the wrong camp in the great controversy? Do we clearly recognize the differences between the narrow road and the broad road? Myra? It has been a question of mine since my youth. Yeah. A Bible study guide says, Paul also encourages intentional discipleship with a vivid image in the phrase, making the best use of time, from Ephesians 5.16, compare... Um, the expression, redeeming yeah, the time. Redeeming the time. Paul uses the verb, and I'm not going to try to say it. Ex agorazo. Okay. Um, drawn from the marketplace, it is an intensive form of the verb to buy, and means to snap up the bargains on offer as we await Christ's return. Time here is the Greek word kairos. Kairos. Okay, let's, let me inter in talk about that for just a second. There's two different time things that used in Greek. One is chronos, from which we of course get chronometer, and that's the hours, minutes, seconds, exactly clicks it off, you know, it doesn't stop, you, nobody can stop it. Kairos means event time, okay, this happened and then something else happened as a result of that or whatever like this. Event time, okay? Okay, so time here in the Greek word kairos, which describes a moment of opportunity. The time until the end is a promising period to be used to the full. It is also an, a, a challenging time because of the days that are evil because the days are evil, okay? And because the course of this world is dominated by the prince of the power of the air. And we know who that is, right? The prince of the power of the air. Do we recognize the urgency of preparing for the second coming? Are we fully aware of Satan's deceitful methods and how to counter them? I have been struggling myself personally for several months now <coughs> thinking we know that there are certain things that will take place leading up to the second coming, certain events. Would it be possible to construct not a timeline in a chronos sense, but saying, okay, these, these things are going to happen, and then these things are going to happen, and then these things are going to happen. Now, you can do that. Now, I already have a book of that at home done by someone who's just quoting the Bible and quoting Ellen White. But could you present that in a way that someone who's not, in, not familiar with it why not present with the Bible necessarily, could say, yeah, I can see that's happening, and this is happening, and this. You ever thought about that? I mean, isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? Tell people, these are the events. This is, the, this is what, what's, what's going to happen, right? 
Well, Paul said that we need to be as wise as bargain hunters in a market so that when we see a really important thing which we need to do or say, we recognize it and take advantage of that moment. Finally, Paul said we need to recognize that community worship with fellow believers is an essential part of our Christian lifestyle. I'm going to take just a second and tell a story. Um, I just read about a gentleman who was in Poland, actually. He was Ukrainian, but he was in Poland, so his Polish wasn't that good. And uh, he was on a rushing home to, to take his wife out to shop for food they needed. He pulled into this gas station because he needed some gas. And then he noticed there was a guy sitting there uh, with his motorbike, and he was trying to get it to start, and the motorbike wouldn't start. And he noticed on the back of one of these uh, insulated packages, so you know this guy was on his way to deliver food to somebody's house. And he could not get the bike to start. And he was just, and oh, he, oh, by the way, he, they had gotten, his group had gotten a bunch of copies of Great Controversy, and they were passing them out to people they thought might be willing to read them. So he, he jumped out of his car while he's filling his gas tank. He hands the guy and says, here's something I really think you ought to read. He gives it to this guy who's trying to get his motorbike going. And he's just about ready to go back in his car and go. He says, but, he said, can I help you? Couldn't I, where does that package need to go to? So he invited the guy, jumped in the car with his package. He says, I'll take you there. He drove me, it was about two, three miles away there, delivered the package, came back, brought, brought him back to the motorbike. And by that time, the guy had notified the company he was working for, and they had somebody there working on the motorbike. And this guy for the motorbike guy just was blown away because someone would actually do that for him. And I'm sure he went home and read the book. Well, that's what you're going to be doing on the corners outside yeah. of the, the temple to Artemis. Yeah, Artemis. The corners in Las Vegas. Yeah. yeah. And Los Angeles in New York. Yeah. Finally, Paul said we need to recognize that community worship with fellow believers is an essential part of our Christian lifestyle. Remember that in Paul's day, Christian churches were not separate buildings. They met in individual homes. There was wonderful fellowship. They often ate together and they nourished each other with their Bible study together. Those were spirit-filled worship occasions. Paul encouraged them to take an opportunity to express their Christian beliefs in songs as well. There's a horizontal, this is from our Bible study guide, there is a horizontal element to worship since in singing, church members are in a sense speaking to one another. However, the specific object of the musical praise is the Lord, which as indicated in Ephesians 5.20 identifies the Lord Jesus Christ, compare Colossians 3.16. The thanksgiving of Ephesians 5.20 described in parallel to the musical praise of Ephesians 5.19 is to be offered unto God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the phrase spiritual songs, the adjective spiritual, Greek pneumatikos, highlights the role of the Holy Spirit in worship since the term describes songs that are inspired by or filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul's sketch of early Christian worship then portrays all three members of the Godhead as active participants from our Bible study guide for Wednesday, August 23. It should be obvious from our lesson so far that Paul had taken a very strong stance against the sinful practices common in Ephesus in his day, and also very common in our day. Shouldn't we feel the same way that Paul did? He also spoke against crude speech. Do we feel so attracted by our association with Jesus Christ that we cannot be drawn into Satan's traps? Paul was inviting us to identify ourselves with Christianity, with commitment, and to enjoy the community and worship that is such an important part of our preparing for the final days of this world's history. I know that, um, I mean, one of the best ways to attract people is if you can invite them into a nice, warm, welcoming group of people that they feel associated with. If you are on occasion involved in what is now called social media, what do you see? None of you are in social media, right? <laughs> there are so many evil and sinful messages of sh or short movies that, quote, go viral. 
What does it mean by saying they go viral? Spread they get rapidly. spread like a virus, huh? Have you ever seen a Christian message go viral? Well, here's some places I would really encourage you to look at them and have a look and see what they're there. What this is, this is a young high school graduate, valedictorian of her class, that has the courage to stand up, and she gave a powerful testimony about why she went to school, how her mother helped her, because her father was dead, I believe, and um, so forth through school, and it was only because of God and Jesus Christ that she was able to be the success that she was. This was a valedictory, valedictory uh, thing given at, at, at school. And I hate to even mention it, but about the same time, there was someone who will not be named also graduating with honors from another university, this in this case, college thing, got up and just, oh, the language was abusive. I mean, can you imagine a valedictory, valedictory speech cursing and swearing against people that were, she came from another part of the world and again, cursing and swearing against people who, who didn't agree with her and telling about how awful everybody is. This is a valedict, valediction speech. Anyway, sometimes Paul and other Christians have been accused of ignoring issues involving sexual misbehavior, even sexual abuse. Isn't it true that Christians must deal with every e evil wherever they are placed with it? We cannot ignore it. How many times per day are we exposed to some temptation from Satan? Paul was facing a world that was caught up in Greco-Roman philosophy, philosophical ideas, pride, and striving for so-called virtue. However, Paul recognized that the Christian looks for his guidance only from God. The consequence of following Satan as demonstrated from the experience of the Ephesians was sexual debauchery, egocentric boasting, and drinking wine. But the Christian's guidance is completely separate from all of those things. Well, it's hard for us who have been so oriented to a Christian background to imagine worshiping the Greek gods Zeus, Metis, Zeus's first wife, Athena, etc. <coughs> I mean, and there's no, no reality to any of those things. You know, they're just stories that people have dreamed up. There are famous aphorisms that came out of those worship practices that became quite popular, such as know thyself and nothing in excess and certainty leads to ruin. Wow. The Greeks loved to suggest that they were lovers of wisdom. And lovers of wisdom are called what? Philosophers, right? While we could spend hours discussing the various philosophical and religious ideas that have grown up over the centuries, there are certain things which have become very clear. Jim? From the Bible Study Guide, despite the rich diversity of philosophical schools, both in the West and in the East, they all share a common foundation. The principle of know thyself this principle shows these philosophies represented a human-centric effort to understand the human real, excuse the, me, the ultimate reality of life, that they infer a way of life, decision-making, and behavior based on human introspection and reason. By doing so, human wisdom, both in the West and in the East, rejected or departed from the divine revelation from the Bible Study Guide. So the difference between all those, I mean, they take different paths, but basically what, they, what are they looking for? They're trying to discover some kind of wisdom that's inherently human. It's not going to be inside them. No. In, in, introspection is not going to give the answer. It, it just, or God says, listen. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. the, the most important precept is to listen. Yeah, and it's not just listening to other human no, beings. No, it's listen to the words of the Creator. Listen to the one that... <laughs> giving us the right answers and knows where we need to go and so forth. Some might think that Paul was being unkind in dealing with the ancient wisdoms. Carrie? But why does Paul characterize the wisdom of the world in such a somber way? Weren't the philosophers of the world also given good advice, teaching a way of life based on justice and mutual respect? Yes, many of them did. 
However, no matter how noble a way of life human philosophy would devise, it would also be deficient, partial, and based on the wrong motivation, rejecting the possibility of the revelation of God. The prop problem of worldly philosophies lies not in what they affirm, but in what they reject or deny. A philosopher may get one aspect of life partially correct, but the rejection of the possibility of God's revelation and the power of his intervention in the world renders his or her philosophy useless for salvation and for life in God's kingdom. Okay, now let's, let me interrupt for a second. So Paul is saying we need to look beyond the here and now. That's really what he's saying, isn't it? He says there's a world out there, there's an everlasting world, existence out there that we need to think in terms of. Now, if you just want to talk about right now, maybe some of these philosophies would work okay for a while, but what do they do for us in, in eternity? Nothing. Yeah. Okay? That is why, for instance, sexual impurity was not considered problematic in the ethics of the most philosophies. And even if some philosophers promoted sexual abstinence, the reasons for doing so were wrong. Hell teaches Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Jennifer, we're going to have to hurry, okay. get started anyway. Ellen G. White, many acts which pass for good works, even deeds of benevolence, will, when closely investigated, be found to be prompted by wrong motives. Many receive applause for virtues which they do not possess. The searcher of hearts inspects motives. And often the deeds which are highly applauded by men are recorded by him as springing from selfish motives and base hypocrisy. Every act of our lives, whether excellent and praiseworthy or deserving of censure, is judged by the searcher of hearts according to the motives which prompted it. So motives is the issue God sees all the way inside our hearts. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, what a sobering message we've heard. In this lesson, and Paul, no doubt guided by your Holy Spirit, perceived the issues involved here and looked back to his friends in Ephesus, and I'm sure he worried about them. Here he is writing from prison. He can't go and see them. He worried about what, they were, what kind of lives they were living while being influenced by all that was around them. We're, we're encouraged when we read revelation that says that that church in Ephesus started out as being a loving and wonderful church. So maybe one day we'll be able to meet many of those people. May, they, may that day come soon is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.